one one two. One, one, two, one.
Good, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing?
Good morning, everyone. Subcommittee will come to order. Today, we'll hear testimony regarding the Medicare Advantage program. We'll hear about these private plans that are chosen by an increasing number of seniors. We'll hear about how these private plans can combine high quality and low costs. We'll look to the future of the popular program and ask when the scheduled cuts to Medicare Advantage plans in the Affordable Care Act take place, can these popular plans continue to effectively serve seniors? Will the policies, the Obama administration narrow choice and plan flexibility, further impacting our seniors? Since seniors were first given the option to select a private health plan to receive their Medicare benefits, they've shown a strong preference for these plans. Over the past decade, enrollment in Medicare Advantage has tripled. Of new enrollees, more than half choose a Medicare Advantage plan over traditional fee-for-service. Today, nearly 16 million seniors are receiving their benefits through these private plans. Medicare Advantage plans are particularly popular with low income and minority seniors. Since these insurance plans are able to provide caps on out-of-pocket costs, coordination of care for seniors, and more predictable costs. The seniors that choose these plans are highly satisfied with the coverage and the benefits they receive. Unfortunately, many of our elderly could lose access to the plans they have and like because of cuts that are just beginning to hit that are part of the President's Affordable Care Act. Knowing just how unpopular these cuts were with the seniors that select these plans, the White House, acting through a new demonstration program and other regulatory actions, masked and delayed the impact of the initial stages of the $300 billion in cuts past the November 2012 elections. Those political delays are over. The difficult reality is 2015 is now upon us, and millions of seniors who rely on the Medicare Advantage program may be in jeopardy of losing their plan, their doctor, and the financial protection benefits they've chosen. The future for Medicare Advantage may look grim. The questionable $8.3 billion quality bonus payment demonstration program used to mask the ACA cuts is now coming to an end. In addition, the new payment methodology for Medicare Advantage plans that assume Congress will fix the way Medicare pays physicians is only temporary. This leaves the looming threat that Medicare Advantage plan rates could again include the broken physician reimbursement formula, lest we finally and permanently fix the way Medicare pays our physicians. So instead of improving the situation, CMS's regulatory actions are threatening plans through potential termination and limiting the, their ability to innovate. For example, Plans serving largely low-income populations find themselves struggling to meet the demands of the Medicare Advantage Star Rating Program. That could place them in jeopardy of being terminated in this coming year, just weeks before enrollment, open enrollment is to begin. Ironically, high-performing Medicare Advantage plans are also in the crosshair. Plans that have consistently found ways to be rated highly in the star system now find themselves unsure of what supplemental benefits they must cut going forward due to backwards incentives under a benchmark cap created by the ACA. As many of us predicted following the passage of the controversial Affordable Care Act, seniors and Medicare Advantage health plans have not yet experienced the full impact of these cuts. And as the full impact of these cuts is felt in the coming years, could millions of seniors be forced out of plans they have and they like? A report released Monday by the American Action Network has mapped out likely benefit cuts per Medicare senior by congressional district, which I would like to enter for the record. And without objection, so ordered. The report points to one glaring conclusion. Seniors in every district in America, Republican or Democrat, now face damaging cuts to the health care and pharmacy benefits they selected because it fits their needs. The Medicare Advantage program is popular among our nation's seniors because it provides seniors with choices to select a plan that best fits their needs. We need to ensure seniors continue to have this valuable option. It's no surprise then that many members of, colleague, of Congress, even our colleagues in the Senate, have recognized the challenges facing seniors and have come out in bipartisan opposition to further cuts to Medicare Advantage. Today we'll hear from witnesses who will tell us the current picture of Medicare Advantage, the good, the bad, and yes, maybe even the ugly. And I'm confident that as we look forward and work together, we can break down barriers and improve Medicare Advantage for America's seniors who depend upon these critical plans. The ACA brings new level of uncertainty to those who depend on Medicare Advantage. 
The time is now to consider the future of these Medicare programs and the importance Medicare Advantage plans play for a growing number of seniors. This subcommittee will hold the administration accountable to carefully examine the impact that any changes to Medicare health plans will have on seniors, the Medicare program itself, and ultimately on taxpayers. We must work together to make sure that our nation's seniors continue to have choices in their care and benefits. Before I recognize the ranking member, Dr. McDermott, for the purposes of an opening statement, I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record. Without objection, uh, so ordered. And I now recognize the ranking member, Dr. McDermott, for five minutes for the purposes of his opening statement. Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. There's a good story to tell about the Medicare Advantage program, and I'm pleasantly surprised by my colleagues across the aisle having provided a stage for us to do that. I kind of wondered what it was about, but as I listened to the chairman, I realized it's more of the scare tactics of the past. Before we get to the good news about the program, we have to hear a lot of specious claims about the ACA's effect on Medicare Advantage, but the truth is somewhat entirely different. Thanks to the changes made by the ACA, both Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare are on a much stronger footing, and we'll hear that from the report from the trustees shortly. Since the passage of ACA, the MA program has seen record high enrollment with more than 15 million Medicare beneficiaries enrolling in the MA pro plan. 30% of all Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage at this point. Since the passage of the ACA, premiums have been reduced or held steady. In total, Medicare Advantage premiums have fallen 14.3%. That means the average Medicare enrollee pays an, uh, $31 month, per month. Underlying Medicare Advantage benefits have been increased in both MA and in traditional Medicare, meaning that the plans have more money to spend on these benefits. Those are the facts. Now, one of the key improvements of the ACA made to MA was to cut down on overpayments that were threatening the solvency of the program. Thanks to misguided provisions put in by the Republicans' 2003 uh, prescription drug legislation, the federal government was paying plans an average of 114% of the costs of traditional Medicare. That's 14% more than if people had stayed in Medicare. They were breaking the program. Independent analysis from the GAO, MedPAC, and other countless others point out that the wasteful spending was putting Medicare on an unsustainable course. To fix this, the ACA improved how we calculate payment rates. These reforms have brought payments to more in line with the costs of traditional Medicare while emphasizing efficiency and quality. Even though we've reduced Medicare Advantage overpayments, insurance companies are doing just fine. Which insurance company has gone in the tank in the last five years? Their stock prices have surged and their, their profits continue to grow. Reducing Medicare overpayments has also improved the Medicare trust solvency and help drive down Medicare spending. It is a fact that overall per capita growth in Medicare spending is at record lows, thanks to ACA. The savings, most of which were recommended from nonpartisan experts, including MedPAC and others, come from changes to payments for plans and providers. And despite their rhetoric, my colleagues on the other side must have thought they were well justified too. In fact, every Republican on this dais has voted multiple times in favor of these very same cuts as part of the Reagan or the Ryan budget. I, Reagan, Ryan, it's all the same. They're Irish. At other times, my Republican colleagues have been known to claim these savings have come at the expense of beneficiaries. That is false. We have increased benefits both in Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare by expanding preventive care eliminating cost sharing for preventive care, and improving coverage for prescription drugs. My colleagues across the aisle also talk about declining choice and access in Medicare Advantage plans. But the reality is that beneficiaries have more access to Medicare Advantage plans. More than 99% of eligible beneficiaries have access to an MA plan, and the average beneficiary has the option to choose between eight 
18 plans. That's not a loss of choice. Given these facts, it doesn't sound to me that the program's having any real difficulty, so I'm very interested to hear the witnesses. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Today we're joined by four witnesses. Chris Wing, Chief Executive Officer at SCAN Health Plan. Uh, Dr. Jeff Burnich, the Senior Vice President and Executive Officer at Sutter Medical Network, testifying, testifying excuse me, on behalf of the CAPG. Robert Book, uh, Senior Research Director at the Health Systems Innovation Network, in healthcare and economic expert at the American Action Forum. And Joe Baker, President of the Medicare Rights Center. Uh, Mr. Wing, you are now recognized for five minutes and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Chris Wing, and I am the CEO of SCAN Health Plan. SCAN was founded in 1977 in Long Beach, California by senior citizen advocates. Their mission back there was very elegant, help seniors stay healthy and independent. I'm happy to say that 37 years later, we have the exact same mission statement. With our focus on our mission statement and the unique and disparate needs of seniors, they're not a homogenous group, we have now emerged as one of the fastest growing MA, pl MA plans in the nation, and we're the fourth largest not-for-profit uh, MAPD plan in the nation. SCAN and our provider partners now care for 170,000 seniors, 120,000 just three years ago. We care for the healthy, the poor, the chronically ill, the disabled, and those in their last days of life. We provide unique products, medical care, and services tailored to meet the very unique and disparate needs of today's seniors. In fact, 30,000 of our members have chosen to participate with us through special knee plans. We have C-SNPs or chronic special knee plans that cover members with diabetes, uh, heart disease, and end-stage renal disease. We have an institutional I-SNP special knee plan for members who are nursing home certifiable. And we also have D-SNPs that offer integration and care for members who are both uh, eligible for Medicare and duly eligible. So these are some of the most frail and underserved members in our nation. We think the diversity of these plan offerings is a, is a major reason why Medicare Advantage has become such a great public policy. So whether you're healthy and yearn for a discounted gym membership, or you require an integrated care team to help you deal with a chronic complex illness, Medicare Advantage has a plan for you. As uh, Congressman McDermott mentioned, now 30% of members, excuse me, 30% of seniors across the country are now enrolled in Medicare Advantage. In my home state, that's 38%. And actually, based on an article from Health Affairs, now half of every Medicare beneficiary becoming eligible for the program is now selecting Medicare Advantage. Perhaps the growth of Medicare Advantage is due to affordability. For our members in 2014, 90% of them pay no monthly premium. Perhaps it's because of low cost use for going to primary care physicians. 80% of our current members have absolutely no copay for seeing a primary care physician. This is extremely important for seniors who have frail health or are on a fixed income. We don't want to create any economic barriers to see their primary care physician. Perhaps the growth of MA is due to quality. And virtually all the quality measure, measurements now point to Medicare Advantage being better than traditional Medicare. Better on diabetes testing, better on breast cancer screening, better on antidepressant medication management, and better on reducing hospital readmit rates. No wonder people are voting with their feet and choosing MA. With that being said, there are significant clouds on the horizon. Over the past few years, the MA program has sustained a series of significant funding cuts. These include the 2.5 billion cut as part of the American Tax Relief Act, a 2% sequestration cut that went into effect last year, and the $200 billion worth of cuts coming from the Affordable Care Act. Some seniors have already begun, and I'm talking about SCAN seniors, some seniors have already began, begun to feel the impact of these cuts and higher out-of-pocket cost, reduced benefits, and more limited provider choice. However, many more seniors in the future will be impacted as the vast majority of these cuts, almost 80%, will take care in future years. Now plans and providers are adapting and evolving to these cuts. We have to, we have no choice. And it's good that we're doing it. Some of the larger plans are vertically integrating to create synergies and, and cost and care savings. 
SCAN is pursuing a more collaborative approach with the bigger systems in Arizona and California. We're a not-for-profit, mission-driven company, and we've enjoyed the trust of our provider groups for 37 years. So we've started an initiative called Provider Integration, where we collaborate with the 14 best and biggest groups on the West Coast. And the goal really is how can we work together to improve the model? The initial focus was on the CMS STAR program, and in just one year, we took our STARS rating in California from 3.5 to 4.5. It's a big deal. But our CMS quality bonus can offset only so much of the cuts. So as Congress and CMS develop Medicare policy, be, we'd ask you to be vigilant regarding the stability of Medicare Advantage. Reimbursement rates cannot continue their ste recent steep decline. As plans, we will work to minimize and mitigate as much of the impact as possible because as we become more efficient, but we ask that Congress and CMS do their best to keep payment rates as stable as possible. CMS should also keep the five-star uh, bonus program stable. As I mentioned, the CMS quality bonus program is probably the biggest sea change event that's changed the focus on quality in my 30 years on managed care. Mr. Wing, I apologize. The time has expired for the opening oh. statement, so thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Burnich. Chairman Brady, Ranking Member McDermott, and members of the Health Care Subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I plan to talk about Medicare Advantage and the benefit from a physician standpoint, how it benefits our seniors. I will describe a program we've developed at Sutter Health to manage some of the sickest, frail patients in this population. I am here as a representative of CAPG, the voice of accountable physician groups that represent 160 medical groups in 20 states and take care of 1.2 million Medicare Advantage lives. I am a physician, an internist, and I serve as a senior vice president and executive officer of the Sutter Medical Network. Sutter Health is a not-for-profit integrated delivery system taking care of 3 million lives in 19 counties in Northern California. We manage the risk of 49,000 Medicare Advantage lives and have taken care of capitated lives for over two decades. We do this with our 5,000 aligned physicians who are clinically integrating and managing care across our hospitals, clinical practices, uh, home care, uh, urgent cares, and surgery centers. So why is MA important to CAPG, Sutter Health, and their physicians? Well, for one, it's a predictable model for population management. The, the physicians, the PCPs, the primary care physicians, know who their patients are. They get lists. We make sure that those patients get in to see their physicians on an annual basis for an annual wellness exam, an annual wellness visit. It's a benefit of the MA program. This helps us understand the risk of those patients, review their medications, their conditions, and do better preventive planning. Secondly, it's, pro it's a predictable budget for managing a population. You get a per member, per month payment so that you can budget each year to take care of these patients and, and budget for programs and the expenses that you incur for those. We have data to understand the utilization of the patterns of these patients so we can better manage the risk and the referrals. MA incentivizes caregivers to coordinate care, reduce costs, and reinvest those savings in the care model like Sutter Health's Advanced Illness Management Program, otherwise called AIM. Fee-for-service does not do this. So, that, so what is AIM and how does it align and support Medicare Advantage beneficiaries? Well, actually, MA is the foundation of our AIM program. In Sacramento, we have a large population of capitated lives, and it allowed us years ago to put care managers both in the hospital and the practice to better coordinate the handoffs from discharge of patient and admission from office. So who are these patients? They're very sick and they're very frail. You may actually know some of them or have members in your family. They average 17 days a year in the hospital, 12 days in the intensive care unit. They take 18 to 30 prescriptions and 54 trips to nine different physicians. These are really sick patients, hence the name AIM. We target the patients with care management model that manages the patients with a multidisciplinary team we uh, use common training and real-time data. And we enroll these patients in several settings, notably in the physician's offices of our network, 40%, both in the hospital and home care. We go to the home and we set goals with these patients. What is it that they want to accomplish? It can be as simple as a grandmother wanting to see her granddaughter graduate high school 
and she's very ill and we need to manage her symptoms. Symptom management is a key ingredient because it keeps those people from picking up the phone, getting the, you know, call 911 and go to the hospital is the usual uh, routine. Um, and then we provide uh, a, a wealth of uh, services to evaluate emotional and nutritional needs. In 2009, we piloted the program in Sacramento again because we had a large MA population. We also applied for an Innovation Challenge Award from CMMI and received that in July of 12. Through that grant, we've spread the, the uh, program across 15 counties, taking care of 5,000 patients with an average daily census of 1,800. We have met the patient's needs by maintaining them in their home environment where they want to choose to be treated. We've decreased unwanted, avoidable hospital, emergency room, ICU stays, and the costs associated with them. The savings are reinvested into the care model and the training and even technology. We're adding video visits this next year so we can better monitor the patients in their home more frequently. In conclusion, I believe Congress and the administration should develop policies that encourage population payments to physician organizations in MA as well as fee-for-service Medicare. Such payments should encourage the organized practice of medicine, strengthen and coordinate the care infrastructure, and build incentives for team-based care. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today as the committee considers important Medicare and fiscal policies in the future. I hope you will reconsider and consider all that the MA program has to offer our senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Book, you recognize for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Brady and Ranking Member McDermott, members of the subcommittee. Can you get your uh, microphone just to see if that's on? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Chairman Brady, Mr. McDermott, members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the opportunity to share my research on the Affordable Care Act and its in, in, impact on seniors and disabled Americans enrolled in Medicare Advantage. Fee for service Medicare has very high deductibles, high co payments, and no limit on out of pocket costs patients can face. Nearly all Medicare beneficiaries seek alternative coverage to reduce those out-of-pocket costs. Some of retiree supplemental coverage from a former employer, and some have an income low enough to qualify for Medicaid. For the rest, MA is now the most popular option. Uh, the 30% of Medicare beneficiaries currently in MA that Mr. McDermott mentioned includes 44% of those who do not have access to retiree supplemental plans from a former employer. Uh, most of the remainder have a Medigap or some other way of a uh, combating those, uh, those high out-of-pocket costs. Medicare is more, more popular among beneficiaries who have lower incomes but above the Medicaid threshold, and, and it's more popular among African Americans and Hispanics. Hispanics in particular, historically, have, have been more than twice as likely as the average Medicare beneficiary to enroll in MA. CBO estimates that ACA cuts to Medicare Advantage will total $308 billion by 2023, and which is approximately 43% of the ACA's total cuts to Medicare. Medic MA payments are tied to benchmark monthly payments set individually for each county, and the ACA makes changes to the way those benchmarks are calculated, with the result that every county in the country will see a cut by 2017, and in fact, 97.9% .9 of counties will see a cut in, in 2015, which is, uh, for which rates have already been published. The, uh, excuse me. The uh, bonus system, based on the star rating system that, you, that uh, Mr. McDermott referenced, I think, uh, I think everyone agrees that paying, for, uh, paying more for good performance is a good thing. However, the, uh, the star rating system does not necessarily accomplish that because CMS chooses the rating criteria after the period of performance. So for example, in the, fir in the first cycle, they measured performance between uh, January 2010 and June 2011, and then in October 2011 announced the criteria on which plans would be rated. So there's, uh, there, since the uh, rules aren't determined until after the game is played, there's, uh, it's difficult for MA plans to tailor their, their performance to the uh, criteria that CMS will reward. That system could, on the other hand, be used as a reward to, uh, to, to reward favored plan sponsors by choosing criteria that give high ratings to those who, uh, who are favored. Favored plans could then use the money to increase their profits and or increasing market share by offering benefits that other plans cannot afford to offer. So instead of allowing plans to compete on a level playing field, the rating system could be used to herd patients into favored plans by manipulating their ability to offer benefits. This uh, is, a, is the reverse of the original goal of Medicare Advantage, which was to increase patient choice. So uh, 
Mr. McDermott mentioned that the, uh, the dire predictions that many of us made for a Medicare Advantage didn't, have not yet come to pass. And that's true because after the ACA was passed, CMS used its regulatory authority in a new way to, to mask the first few years of cuts. They, they created a new star rating plan, bonus program different from the program in the, in the Affordable Care Act, which gave uh, bonuses to almost all plans with the result that, uh, that most of those cuts have not, have not actually uh, uh, hit, hit patients or plans yet. So uh, based on published rates for each county in 2015, now that the bonus program's ended, the total cut will be, uh, will be about $317 per month compared to the year before, but $1,530 or 13% below the pre-ACA baseline. So this demonstrates the extent to which the, uh, the pilot program authority was used to offset cuts that were mandated by the Affordable Care Act. Now, uh, the Affordable Care Act phases in and calls for the rates to be phased in through 2017, so there are more cuts to come. The, uh, assuming the Affordable Care Act cuts are implemented as, uh, as passed by Congress, by 2017, the, the cumulative cut relative to the uh, pre-Affordable Care Act baseline will be $3,700 per beneficiary per year, which is nearly a 27% overall cut. It's going to be extremely difficult, perhaps impossible, for plans to maintain their prior level of benefits in the face of those drastic cuts. The, uh, every beneficiary will see some combination of either higher co-payments, higher deductibles, a higher monthly premium in excess of the Part, ben Part B premium they already pay, or reduced benefits or, or plan services or smaller provider networks. Now this uh, impact is going to be different for each plan as each plan Deals with, the, deals with the cuts in its own way, but uh, it will affect, one way or another, it will affect everybody. This will affect not only uh, seniors' financial stability, but also their access to health care. Mr. Book, I'm sorry that your time has expired, so thank you very much. Mr. Baker, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brady, uh, Ranking Member McDermott, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the future of Medicare Advantage. Each year, Medicare Rights uh, Center counsels thousands of people with Medicare about topics ranging from enrolling in a plan to appealing a denied claim. For people with Medicare, we find there is no one-size-fits-all choice. Medicare Advantage plans are a good option for some, but for many, original Medicare remains a better choice for them. My testimony today makes two key points about the MA program that I hope will inform your debate. First, the MA program has been made more attractive to beneficiaries through benefits and protections contained in the Affordable Care Act. Second, the MA program continues to be stable and strong. There is rising enrollment and widespread plan availability with decreases in average plan premiums and no significant changes in benefits and cost sharing. There are four significant ways in which the ACA has brought improvements to the MA program. First, the ACA is decreasing reimbursement overpayments to MA plans. According to MedPAC, on average, MA plans were paid 114% of costs under original, more than original Medicare, or about 1,000 more poor enrollee. These overpayments drove up premiums for all Medicare beneficiaries, including those who remained in original Medicare. The Affordable Care Act brings down these overpayments to level the playing field between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Second, the ACA enhanced coverage and reduced costs for certain types of preventive care which are now available to both people in Medicare Advantage and in original Medicare. Third, the ACA prohibited MA plans from charging higher cost sharing for services used by sicker beneficiaries, including renal dialysis, chemotherapy, and skilled nursing care. Once again, these reforms leveled the playing field between the MA program and original Medicare, but also among, uh, among the MA plans themselves, lessening their ability to cherry pick, select healthier, not select uh, so, uh, not so healthy uh, enrollees. Fourth and finally, the act, the act mandated a medical loss <coughs> ratio, requiring that Medicare Advantage plans spend 85% of premiums on care, not on administrative costs or profits. With these changes under the ACA, the MA program can remain stable and shows improvement by, shown, uh, by five different indicators. First, Medicaid, Medicare itself is on a stronger financial footing. Improved efficiency in the MA program translates into tangible savings for all people with Medicare. This year, the Part B premium 
paid by both people uh, with original Medicare as well as those with uh, Medicare Advantage remains at 2013 levels at uh, $104.90 per month. Second, Medicare Advantage enrollment is at an all-time high with nearly 16 million enrollees and CBO projects future growth at a healthy clip. Third, plan choice remains strong. In 2014, the average beneficiary has a choice of among uh, 18 Medicare Advantage plans. Fourth, <laughs> premiums have gone down. The average Medicare Advantage premium was $44 a month in 2010, compared to $35 a month in 2014. Fifth, plan benefits and costs sharing remain unaffected. Uh, unaffected sorry. Uh, covered benefits and cost sharing remain stable from year to year. There is no evidence of an overall trend towards less generous benefits. Even with this success, Congress can and should take steps to further improve Medicare Advantage while also preserving and strengthening original Medicare. For example, by increasing support for the SHIP programs, these are the state health insurance uh, programs, which provide free and unbiased counseling in each state to support seniors and people with disabilities and their decision making. By enhancing transparency on Medicare Advantage plan performance through public release of plan reported data, this is especially important uh, to see how Medicare Advantage plans are managing claim denials or care denials and the appeals of those denials. And also by encouraging meaningful variation among plans. And I stress that meaningful variation. Congress should explore further standardizing Medicare Advantage plan benefits to help consumers make apples to apples comparisons among plans. Efforts are also needed to further consolidate plan choices for consumers so that they can make a meaningful choice to make sure that they're accessing the right plan for them or they're looking at Medicare Advantage in uh, contrast to original Medicare in the, in the correct way. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Baker, and thank you for the testimony from all four uh, witnesses. Um, the reason we're holding this hearing is that this, the Affordable Care Act cut slashed more than $300 billion out of Medicare Advantage that so many of our seniors rely upon. Uh, the cuts were delayed through various actions. That's what Mr. Baker's testimony is all about, but didn't happen. I agree. It didn't happen because the cuts were delayed. Now they're becoming real, and there's no way it won't have some impact on seniors. The hearing today is to figure out what it, will that impact be. Mr. Book, uh, as you describe in your testimony, the cuts of Medicare Advantage are becoming real for millions of seniors. Now, there is no magic bean here. These cuts will land on them. Some suggest, and, and your testimony said that there, you would be forced to spend $3,700 less per senior as a result of these cuts. Some suggest these simply eliminate inflated profits for Medicare Advantage plans and, or have made them uh, more efficient. But as we all know, CMS requires MA plans to bid on Medicare's guaranteed benefits, A, B, D, as well as administrative costs, expected price. So this is all part of the bid. So question to you is what, what is the real impact on our seniors as results of the cuts that really begin next year for Medicare Advantage? So the um that, that $3,700 per, per senior per month or per enrolled member is going to have to be made up for by uh, either, either reductions in benefits, increased copays, increased premiums. That's, uh, that, that's really all there is. They can reduce, pro, pro, restrict provider networks so there are few, fewer physicians seniors can see. Those are about all the options they have. You mentioned profit. The average uh, healthcare company makes a profit of about 3 to 5% on all of their business, including their commercial and you know, private sector business. And the, uh, these cuts are 27%. So there's, a, there's no way they can make up these cuts just by reducing their profit. Even if they were willing to run profit down to zero, there's simply not enough room. They're going to have to make significant, very significant cuts in the uh, benefits they provide to seniors or increase their costs, increase their prices that right. seniors pay above what we have to reduce the benefits. Right. Or you have to increase the cost to right. seniors. There, there's no other room. Deductibles. There, yeah. That's correct. You don't have a magic bean that you'll be using. Uh, perhaps one of the positions here could me mention a magic bean, but I think if we had that, we would have used that already. Yeah, I would think so. Mr. Wing, Dr. Burnish, let's talk about 
what we know has already happened. Uh, I was around the last time Congress went after Medicare private plans in the 1997 Balanced uh, Budget Act. According to CBO estimates, the time that law took $97 billion out of the plans. This is three times greater than that. But I was there when almost 2.5 million seniors lost their plans, some of them in our communities. I remember taking the calls. I remember trying to figure out how we were going to get them in other plans. I remember how upset they were they liked what they had. Um, and there was an uproar. So much so, Congress uh, intervened in 2003 and created new incentives to Medicare Advantage plans, resulting in the successful program we ha have today. Now, uh, with the $300 billion in cuts, it feels like, as Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. Aren't we likely to see similar levels of upset seniors once they start to feel the pain of these cuts? Mr. Wing, Dr. Burnage? Um, I think the answer is yes. I can't speak for the industry, but we submitted our bid for 2015 uh, in the first week of June, and there will be uh, withdrawals from markets. There will be withdrawals of products from certain markets. Withdrawals from markets means there we will leave. be fewer Medicare Advantage plans offered to fewer seniors. I can't speak for the total industry, but I know there are, there's one geography where SCAN will be leaving in 2015 entirely. There's probably four or five counties where we're withdrawing some of our special need products. And in virtually all of our markets, we will be increasing what we ask seniors to pay, especially on the Part D, um, the RX benefits. Sure. There will also be a slight trimming of the networks, both in Arizona and California. You'll be able to see fewer doctors, fewer hospitals, less choice. Yes. Yeah. And those, that impact would not be occurring without these Affordable Care Act cuts? You know, we're a not-for-profit, but we need to have a, a margin. And right now in, in 2014, we have a negative margin, so we love caring for seniors. Negative so, margin means your profits are so large you're actually losing money? We're losing money. Yeah. Dr. Burns. So, Bubba, 1997, I lived through it. I practiced it uh, uh, in Ohio. It was not pleasant. It was painful uh, for uh, those that we cared for. Uh, it left a bad taste in the physician's mouth. Um, I think you have to have choice. Narrow networks takes away choice, but it also takes away quality physicians. Uh, and I'm here as a physician. I'm not here as a health plan. And I think it's important to offer choice in a broader network. So there's a broad uh, palette of uh, services. Um, the programs like AIM would never get off the ground. And when you look at the expenditures in Medicare, 28% of all CMS dollars are spent in the last year of life, and half of that's in the last month. So the plan that targets the most uh, sick and chronically ill seniors would not have gotten off the ground? No. And it won't be sustainable either. And then the last uh, piece I'd say is uh, physicians have to manage overhead. And at some point, that those past cuts down to them through the health plans is they'll just disengage, and even the plans that do exist in counties, they won't be in them. They'll go back to fee for volume. And if you recall, after BBA 97, if you looked at the uh, rate of increase of expenditures, they, they plateaued a little bit after 97, and then they went up much faster than they did in the previous 10 years. I think the same thing could happen occur if you do that now. You think the impact on seniors will be the same or greater? Uh, than the cuts in the balanced budget agreement? Don't know, but I know that uh, physicians will figure out how to cover their overhead by doing more things. Doing more things, seeking revenue other sources? Uh, they'll, they'll do more testing, they'll do more invasive procedures, they'll, they'll, they'll do what they did after 1997. Yeah. Kind of finished with this. Um, I'd hate to say that, but I think. No, I know. I look, no magic mean here. Um, Care coordination, innovation within Medicare Advantage, I think it's been hugely helpful long term for our seniors. What's the impact of that when you're facing these cuts? Um, is that at risk? Well, I think the care coordination that's very, very valuable for the population we serve is, our, is the dual eligibles, the seniors and our CSNPs, our seniors and our ISNPs. Every year, uh, we have to do an upfront assessment, an HRA, if you will. We have to develop a care management plan, a multidiscipline care management plan. And we love to do the special need plans, but they're underfunded. We need, <laughs> so they will be uniquely impacted with these cuts as opposed to a vanilla uh, MAPD program. So um, 
in the 20th century, uh, a physician could practice and manage 25 to 30 drugs and a dozen tests. And now uh, people are living longer, they're more complex, they're more complex drugs. You need a village of people to take care of people. So team-based care is a 21st century concept and it's evolving. Some people call it patient-centered medical home. I call it team-based care. Those teams are comprised of individuals such as care managers, nurse practitioners, sometimes uh, a pharmacist, social worker, uh, behavioral therapist, because these, these people that are living longer are having much more complex problems, and physicians by themselves, internists like myself, can't do it alone. And if they don't have those teams around them, the patients will go back to falling through the cracks like they have uh, in the past, and so I think the members of those teams, those budget cuts, will take those people right out of the program. Yeah. Well, here's my here, final point. Thank you for the testimony, all of you. I, you know, around here, if there's a my, if there's a three billion dollar cut to Medicare, the place goes crazy. We are ending Medicare as you know it. Three hundred billion dollar cut to seniors today. Some say, oh, it's no problem. Nothing's going to happen. There's going to be real impact. It's coming at us soon. I think seniors need to know what the impact is, and I think Congress needs to find a way uh, to try to avoid these serious cuts on our seniors. Dr. McDermott, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I asked to have uh, a couple of graphs put up on the uh, uh, monitors because <clears throat> one of them shows the Medicare Advantage um, premiums. And you see that line that starts up high there and goes down in this flat? That blue line is the premiums of Medicare. Now, we've had these uh, harbingers of disaster come in here and tell us that, oh my God, this is the end of Medicare. What we've done with these cuts is going to just end Medicare and it's going to make it price it out of people's ability. But the fact is the premiums have stayed down. Now, the CBO, if you look at those three lines, the green line is what CBO projected would happen to MA in terms of enrollment after the enact or before the enactment of the law. The red line is what they projected after it passed, and the green and the blue line, the one that goes up to almost 15 million, is the fact of what has actually happened. CBO has not projected correctly on what was going to happen with MA. All the disaster uh, folks who come out here, like Cassandra, telling us it's the end of the world, are clearly not being able to project what's going on. We have made the cuts. They've already been started in 2011. We've been gradually reducing the amount that Med Medicare Advantage programs are getting. What that does is force doctors and programs to figure out how to do it more efficiently. Now, what I'm hearing from the three of you is give us more money. Do you people understand that you came to the wrong place? These guys aren't going to give you more money. They won't. They can't raise taxes for highways, much less more money for Medicare. So you're asking for more money. They're not telling you you're going to get more money. They just want to scare the old people. And your job is going to be how do you deal with the money that you're going to get? Because they're voting for these cuts. The Ryan budget has had them in every single time. Just for the and record, I, I would say no Republican voted for the Medicare Advantage cuts in the Affordable Care Act. No Republican voted for this. And this, in this and chart, this it doesn't recognize that the administration delayed the cuts, 80 percent of them. Mr. Chairman. The Ryan budget uses the savings from the Affordable Care Act and how you can parse it any way you want. But the you Ryan budget for it. is not the law today. They're, these are li people are living under real cuts, under right. real law. And they're, Mr. Baker, you've listened to this. Should seniors be worried as we go into this election about these cuts? Um, given the experience that we've had thus far, I don't think so. In our discussions with uh, plan executives, both in New York State but in other areas of the country, um, we've heard that certainly plans are concerned, but they are also very concerned with keeping market share um, in their MA products, which they think are uh, profitable and which they think are, you know, very valuable to their product lines, particularly in an environment 
now under the Affordable Care Act where they could potentially cover someone, you know, cradle to grave, as it were. Are they putting in bids? I mean, we hear that somebody's pulling out of a market, so I guess maybe some are, some aren't? Yes. I mean, I think that the experience, once again, every particular plan is making a decision about whether or not to increase uh, market share in particular markets, pull in or go in or pull out. And that's what we've seen consistently over the course of the history of the Medicare Plus Choice and then the Medicare Advantage program. These are private entities that make business decisions based upon reimbursement and a number of other factors about whether to enter a particular market or leave a particular market. And certainly BBA, other reimbursement changes can uh, affect that behavior, but there's a whole host of other issues that can be specific to particular plans that have nothing to do with reimbursement. Let around me ask you one quick decision. question. Are those plans open so that you can see what they're offering seniors in their Medicare Advantage? Open how? I'm sorry. Open to you to look at them and see if they're cutting benefits? Yes. I mean, we've had, um, we study plans in New York and we've looked at plans across the country and we've not seen any significant change in benefits year to year and no trend in that regard. Well, they're, they're making a bid based on the law as it presently is and the cuts that are being phased in over a period of time, slowed down by the administration, they are making bids on that basis and they say they can make it. Uh, many of the plans that I talk to say they can make it. Many, and I think in the, in the testimony of some of the witnesses today, there are a ver variety of strategies like looking for those four and five star ratings, which still bring uh, significant bonuses to you know weather this and also other efficiencies to bring to bear. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the record, Mr. Baker, the trends haven't changed because the cuts haven't occurred. This hearing is about the future and the impact of our seniors. Mr. Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Wing, uh, Dr. Burnich, and, and Mr. Book, I, you know, my district back home includes Collin County, Texas. That's uh, Dallas and Plano. Uh, my district is about 24% yes. Medicare beneficiaries, and they have opted out of traditional fee-for-service Medicare and enrolled in Medicare Advantage because there are more advantages, obviously. Since Obamacare became law, Medicare Advantage enrollment has doubled in our county, yet benefits are expected to be cut over $2,600 per person, and the total number of plans has already begun to decline. And I wonder if each of you can just explain what cuts mean for Medicare beneficiaries in my county and the nation, and if these beneficiaries lose access to their Medicare Advantage plan, what challenge will they face when they have to re-enroll in a fee-for-service uh, Medicare, and, and is that going to work? Mr. If, Wing? If I may, I'll just uh, speak to the SCAN experience, and SCAN is operational in uh, Arizona, Northern California, and Southern California. I don't think the experience in Texas is going to be much different from in California or Arizona for 2015, 16, 17. We're trying to shoot for a small margin, you know, but no margin, no mission. And we're being forced to do things we don't want to do. We're a not-for-profit. Our, our whole mission is to improve the health and independence of our, of our members. But with the cuts and the changes, we're going to have to, as I mentioned, withdraw from one geographic market, withdraw products, especially the special need products that are probably the most important products of the MA program because they deal with the most frail seniors. But our, we can't sustain. They're hard for us to sustain in good times. With these cuts, in some geographies, we're going to have to withdraw them. And for our core programs, we are going to have to make some changes, more cost of uh, share participation on the part of the beneficiaries. I think you'll see that in Texas. I think you'll see that across the land. Thank you. Dr. Burnish. I think the biggest concern for me is access to care for, uh, for patients, particularly if they get disenrolled from a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, Fee-for-service Medicare and primary care, uh, it's hard to, to, to run a practice off of that. You have to really kind of manage a percentage, if you will, of the patients you will. Those, those patients, if they get disenrolled from an MA plan, might have trouble getting into a PCP. Uh, not to mention we have a shortage of PCPs. We have an aging uh, population that's growing. So we're really putting pressure on access to care. Yeah, and don't you see some docs even getting out of the business? Absolutely. That's that's what I'm seeing. 
Yeah, I don't Mr. think California and Texas are different there. Yeah, Mr. Book. I think the uh, impact in uh, in the type of impact is going to be the same throughout the country. The individual dollar amount of the impact is going to vary from uh, from county to county and state to state. And the reason for that is the uh, benchmark rates are set at the county level, and they're set by a in the past, they've been set by a somewhat arbitrary formula, and now we're just transitioning to a different somewhat arbitrary formula. So the difference between the old rates and the new rates is going to vary from place to place. So it's going to be much, you know, it, it, the, uh, the counties that are hit worst are in uh, Louisiana. The counties that are hit let least are in Montana on average. Um, but it's the types of impacts we're going to see are the same. Everybody is going to see a reduction in benchmarks. Everybody is going to see an increase in out-of-pocket spending and or a reduction in benefits. It's, it's going to happen everywhere. And it's not a, you know, you, know you, you put up that nice chart of what would have happened if the Affordable Care Act had been implemented, but it wasn't implemented. So, of course, the predictions didn't come true. That's kind of like if you say if you jump off a building, you'll hit the ground. But if you, but if you say, well, I'm not going to jump off the building yet, so I'm still fine, uh, you really haven't... Uh, that doesn't really mean that, you should, that it's okay to jump off the building. <laughs> I hope we don't go jump off a building. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'm ashamed that this administration decimates Medicare, especially Medicare Advantage, uh, to pay for Obamacare. And while they're playing political games and covering up these cuts until after the election, Medicare beneficiaries in my district and around the nation are losing benefits and access to their preferred Medicare Advantage plan. So I, I just want to thank you for holding this hearing and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Gerlach. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with the premise that uh, Dr. Book made in his testimony that the average reduction in benefits for 2017 uh, relative to the pre-ACA baseline. You're welcome is going to be over $3,700 per beneficiary per year, or about 27 percent. So uh, if you would make that or make that an assumption for the purpose of my question uh, for each of you, uh, what do you think that kind of impact is going to have, particularly on the area of the dual eligibles? Uh, and of course, that varies. The, the affluence of counties, uh, of course, vary. The number of dual eligibles per county vary. The benchmarks, therefore, ba uh, vary. But in terms of the scope and breadth of your current activity, uh, recognizing that unique population of the Medicare uh, patients, the dual eligibles, who tend to be more disadvantaged, who tend to have uh, uh, more severe health risks, what do you think the impact of Dr. Book's uh, prognostication would be, particularly with regard to that patient population? And it would start with you, Mr. Wing. Well, we've been dealing with, uh, thanks for the it's a great question. Uh, we've been dealing with the dual eligibles in California, where the, the only FIDA SNP that actually integrates Medi Cal and Medicare streams. Um, a 27 count over the next three years, just take what I said about what we're doing for 15 and magnify it by three or four. Oh. You know, these frails, they need a lot more, they're the frailest of the frail. And to reduce the network, and especially when all the pilots are counting on passive enrollment. But if they lose the continuity of care with their trusted physician, they're going to bounce back into Medicare free for service. And that's going to really cost the system because it's not just going to be the Medicare dollars are at risk. Without a good care management program, they could very well end up in custodial and long-term care. And when members typically go into custodial care, typically they don't come out. And that's not as far as the dignity, the cost of the system. So much narrower networks, which has a corresponding impact as far as the passive enrollment will go way down. They'll opt back into Medicare fever service. And without the care management the doctor just talked about, they'll probably end up in institutions and then long-term care. And you talk about a short-sighted strategy. We need more care management for the more frail populations, whether they're duly eligible, ESRD, chronically ill, we need more care management to keep them out of the ERs, to keep them out of the acute settings, and most importantly for the duals, to keep them out of custodial care. Okay. Doctor? Yeah, the primary care physician for most dual eligibles in this country is the emergency room. Uh, and then they clog up the emergency room for people who really need the care. And it's not that they don't need the care, but they can be managed in a lower cost setting. In those 1,800 patients that are in AIM a day right now, 11% of them are dual eligible. 
And I can tell you in a poor county like Sonoma, where uh, in Santa Rosa, the residents came to me and said, this is the greatest program because now we don't have to manage these people in the hospital. And they take, they're in the hospital for a long time. They take up a lot of resources. And then they get lost to follow up because they have no care coordination. So that's a concern I have. Mm -hmm. Dr. Book. Right, uh, I would agree with that. And I'd also add that um, it, dual eligibles get assistance from Medicaid in paying their uh, fee-for-service co-pays. Co and, uh, and if they enroll in Medicare Advantage, their, M their Medicare Advantage premiums and co-pays. The Medicare Advantage, so, so in addition to a, you know, getting access to a coordinated care through Medicare Advantage, they also end up saving the state's money because the, uh, the amount Medicare has to pay to put someone into a Medicare Advantage program is a lot less than the co-pays they would pay if that same person were in fee-for-service. So if we reduce the Medicare Advantage benchmarks and plans end up exiting markets, and we, there are fewer MA plans and they take fewer patients, we're going to have dual eligibles who are transitioning out of Medicare Advantage, losing their coordinated care, losing the, the doctors and, and hospitals that know them and that they know, and, and in addition, costing the Medicaid program more money. So we, you know, we cut the program. We don't actually save the money. We just put it somewhere else. Oh. Mr. Baker. Um, I think it's important to note that the Affordable Care Act has made significant investments in dual eligibles through demonstration projects, and, and those are getting underway now. Um, I think certainly we all uh, agree that there needs to be better care coordination for this population, which is very vulnerable, and that needs to occur across the board, both in MA but also in the fee-for-service program through either of these demonstration projects or through things like um, accountable care organizations or other efforts that the ACA has put forward um, so that really they're available to all people with Medicare, not just people in Medicare Advantage. Thank you all for your testimony, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blumenauer is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I appreciate uh, being able to have a little deeper dive on some of the impacts of Medicare Advantage. Uh, I think my community has the highest penetration of Medicare Advantage in the country or close to it. Um, and so I've been following this closely. Uh, part of uh, the issue is that there's an opportunity to coax more value. There are, there are some extraordinarily high cost areas around the country. We, we kind of think we're a little discriminated against in, in our community. We have pretty high value uh, outputs, low costs, and we see them these things scattered around the country. So I think there is nationally an opportunity to extract more value. We, we ought to do it carefully, and I appreciate the admonition from some of our witnesses. Uh, one of the areas, however, in terms of coaxing more value out of uh, managed care, I think is an opportunity to deal with value-based insurance design. Um, and uh, rather than quack on, my friend and colleague, uh, Congresswoman Black, uh, I'm looking forward to working with her, co-sponsoring legislation. Uh, but I, since it's, she is the lead co-sponsor, I would like to yield, if I could, for her because uh, she's a little further down the line and may need more time uh, uh, if you would uh, care to comment or ask questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. And I am so delighted that we're working together on this concept because this is one that I believe down the road is going to show us real benefit. And um, having been a nurse for 40 years, I know specifically in nursing, if we can get um, someone, particularly those that have chronic conditions like diabetes and cardiovascular <coughs> disease, if we can get them to stay on their regimen, that they're going to be a lot more healthy, they're going to save costs in the long run, and quality of care for them is certainly going to be better. And so this um, bill that we have together, and we've just filed it, H it's H.R. 5183, would incentivize the insurance companies, that would set up a demonstration project, um, to incentivize the insurance companies to use those kind of mechanisms that would give incentives to the patients for them to um, make sure that they're using what we know will make them healthy. For instance, uh, if you're diabetic, that there would either be low co-pays or no co-pays on things such as insulin, um, that maybe there would be no cost to go and see your primary care doctor um, for things like foot mapping and so on that we know are uh, already proven to uh, keep people healthy. And so I'm delighted that we're able to have this bill together, and I hope that it will pass so we can get this demonstration project, show that it does work, and then roll it out um, all across this country. So, Mr. Blumenauer, I'll yield back to you so that you can ask whatever question you. Yeah. of the 
Well, I, 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 think it, I think it's important for us to uh, be able to push. Them. One of the things that I like about the Affordable Care Act is that there were a number of pilot projects. There are tests uh, because uh, we're going to be in the middle of health care reform uh, for the next decade. But I think this is an, uh, is an opportunity to provide the right sort of incentives for patients, uh, doing it on a couple of pilot project bases, uh, a couple of plans, uh, to be able to see what works and what doesn't. I know there are some people that have some uh, concerns. They want to make sure that, uh, that it is done appropriately. And I think we can do that. So I'm looking forward to uh, the rollout of the bill. I hope uh, that this might be on the list that I've talked to the chairman about, that I think there are a variety of areas that we ought to be able to agree that has nothing to do with um, Obamacare, that this is, these are things that we can move forward on. Mr. Gerlach has uh, a proposal that I think has great merit. Um, I've uh, been working with Dr. Poe on uh, the uh, end of life care uh, with uh, some 50 bipartisan co-sponsors. I would hope, Mr. Chairman, that there would be an opportunity for us to have uh, hearings on uh, things that uh, aren't necessarily we're going to be hearing about on the Sunday talk shows, but could make a difference. And I think uh, this is an example, and I look forward to working with my colleague, and I hope we can bring it back before the committee for further discussion. Thank you. And, no, and thank back. you, Mr. Blumenauer. Um, Dr. Price is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for uh, holding this hearing and thank the witnesses. I think it's incredibly important that we focus on, on what's going to happen. Uh, we, we know uh, what has happened to date, and, and we differ on, many of us differ on, on uh, what the effect of that has been regarding the Obamacare or ACA. I do want to touch on uh, something that Dr. McDermott said, though, because it's, it's important for the witnesses to know, it's important for the folks in this room to know, it's important for the people across this country to know that no Republican voted for these cuts to MA. Not one. Not one in the House, not one in the Senate. Uh, and my friend from Washington State talks about uh, uh, the, them being included in the budget. The budget is required when we pass a budget. We're required to assume current law. That's, that's where we start. And so what we do is take the money that has been stolen and raided from Medicare and put it back in to Medicare. That's how we secure, save, and strengthen uh, Medicare. Uh, so it's important that we, that we set the record straight on that. Uh, Dr. Book, I want, to, I want to touch on this star rating program and dive a little deeper on it. This, this is a program that, as I understand it, was, was put in place by CMS to allow beneficiaries to be able to tell different things about, about plans, compare the plans. And yet it is now morphed into a, a, a uh, program where Medicare, where CMS uses it to provide payments. Right, um, that's correct. Does that make any sense at all? Uh, well, not as the program is currently constituted, no. Uh, originally, the idea was that CMS would help Medicare beneficiaries choose an MA plan by giving ratings based on their criteria. And if a beneficiary wanted to use those criteria to choose their plan, they could. And if they wanted to go and investigate on their own and call up a plan and see, you know, what doctors do you cover and what services do you cover, they could, com they could ignore the star ratings if they wanted to and make their own decision. And that makes sense. I think that's fine. Makes, makes some sense. Uh, but to take that, once you take that system and use it to make payments, you're, you're, uh, you're adjusting the benefits that the plans can offer, and you're saying that, you know, to a, uh, to a senior who, who has, who has, whose criteria are different from that of the bureaucrats in CMS, right. you know, if you like a different plan, you're going to have to pay more or accept lower benefits if your criteria are different from the bureaucrats' criteria. So and this uh, I, don't, I don't think that, I think that undermines the goal of patient choice, which was one of the goals right. of having Medicare Advantage in the first yeah, place. Yeah, we would agree. This is, a, this is another Washington knows best strategy. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we know what's exactly. best for you as and, a patient. And, and from what I understand, CMS instituted the star rating program on its own as a, just as a way of helping seniors, and then later it was incorporated by, by, into the Affordable Care Act, you know, assuming it would continue to exist, and saying, okay, now pay people that way. That's my understanding as well. Yes. Now, the, you, in your testimony, you, you talk about um, some perverse incentives, some disincentives in right. the star rating program for, for having docs care for uh, the sickest patients out there, the ones with the highest comorbidities, the ones with the greatest health challenges. Can, can you expand on that? Right, so some, some of the criteria uh, uh, some of the criteria give negative ratings to plans if, if certain things happen, we, and a plan could game the system by, by treating, you know, healthier patients, a healthier mix of patients. And we really don't want that. Really, the people who need the treatment are the sickest patients. 
And we don't want, and if you set up a, a, a criteria that says, you know, how many people achieved some certain benchmark without adjusting for how healthy or unhealthy they were when they came to see you, then, you know, we're not really being fair to the doctors. We're saying we're going to penalize you if you take care of the hardest cases. One and the, I think that's the opposite of what we ought to be incentivizing. One of the huge uh, um, uh, challenges that we have is to try to incentivize physicians to right. continue in practice. Uh, Mr. Johnson mentioned Doc's fleeing practice as a former practicing right. physician. I hear from my former colleagues all the time. Uh, many of them are just looking for the exit doors because of these kinds of rules uh, and, and, and regulatory oppression that they're, that they're working under right now. Um, right, right. And th this exists also in the fee-for-service system. There's this uh, notion of pay for performance where you pay doctors for doing a, for, for a, pr doing, you know, what they call evidence-based care. What it really is, is they have a list of, uh, of things that you're supposed to do for a patient for a, with a particular diagnosis. And if you check all these boxes, you get more money. So for example, you're supposed to tell everyone who had a, had a heart attack to take aspirin. Well, that's great for most patients, but what if the guy's allergic to aspirin? Yeah. If you get patients with people allergic to aspirin, Resident we're going to pay you less. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's uh, no. It, it, again, Washington knows best. I want to touch very quickly on this thirty-seven hundred dollars, Mr. Wing, because you mentioned your margin was was uh, two to three percent, as I recall. Oh, I have no margin. I'll lose money in two thousand and fourteen. So, so if 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 <clears throat> if what Mr. Book says is correct, and that is that that payments are going to go down from the federal government per patient thirty-seven hundred dollars a year. What happens to your model? Well, we have levers. And first, I have to become more efficient. And we, we spent $40 million on a new IT system that should be implemented. Can you absorb $3,700 cut per patient? No, not, not without you. extraneous changes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to our witnesses as well. Um, the, the chart that we saw earlier uh, is very interesting, and certainly it's enlightening in terms of the trends that uh, they indicate. I'm, I'm sure you saw the chart as well. Uh, Mr. Book, now the, the cuts would take place in 2015. Is, is that correct? Well, we already have published rates for 2015 that incorporate, that incorporate those cuts. Yes, we have not. You know, the, the rates are published. The specific rates are published one year at a time, so we've seen the first year of cuts already. So are we going to see some trends, uh, some different trends from the lines in, in this graph? I, I believe so, yes. In fact, uh, you know, as uh, my colleague mentioned, there is al they're already withdrawing from uh, one geographic area, and that's, that's one plan sponsor withdrawing from one area. I think we're going to see uh, more withdrawals and more increases in premiums. A again, uh, th this year the change from last year is only 3%, but that's because the Affordable Care Act's cuts for last year were offset by, by regulatory action. So uh, we're, the transition from 2014 to 2015 is going to be less than it would have been you know, before. Once you start moving forward, we're going to see you know, substantial changes unless there's some other action you know, if, if it, that causes the Affordable Care Act not to be implemented. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Baker, do you believe that these trends can continue with the impending changes? Well, certainly um, recent projections by the CBO uh, continue to indicate that there will be rising uh, enrollment in Medicare Advantage and that the initial projections are, are and the CBO took into account these changes in reimbursement methodology, um, that there will continue to be a different, you know, different projections, better projections about ongoing enrollment in Medicare Advantage. So um, it does look like plans will be able to absorb um, these cuts. They will be able to innovate around and it be But how long efficient. do you think they can absorb and, and just kind of uh, continue amidst the many of these conditions? I, I mean, my concern is <clears throat> uh, overall that uh, healthcare professionals are, are frustrated. Uh, they, they don't like <clears throat> the, the view of the future. It uh, concerns me greatly, especially as a representative of a rural, a part of rural America, uh, that uh, health care providers, uh, when I hear from them, they're discouraging their, their young, uh, uh, young, they're discouraging young people, especially family, mem family members from going into health care. And <clears throat> this is because of the federal government uh, making such a bureaucracy of, of health care. And uh, I'm very concerned that uh, such a reduction in, in providers, it's already difficult to find providers in, in rural America, and it stands to get to much worse. And uh, lack of providers means less competition in, in urban areas and less mere access uh, in rural areas. 
and uh, we, uh, we see that there might be, uh, that there will likely be uh, disproportionate impact to Medicare Advantage choices in, in rural America. Mr. Book, can you elaborate on that? Perhaps it, is it correct that there would be a disproportionate uh, reduction of choices in, in rural America? I haven't looked specifically at the uh, rural urban distinction, but if you want, I can, I, I can I get back to you on that later. In general, plans that have a, so, some of the rural counties had adjustments, uh, had upwards adjustments in their benchmarks prior to the ACA. That indicates they might be hit harder, but I would have to uh, check the numbers to be sure. Okay, I would appreciate any any further uh, uh, information on I, that. I can do that, yes. I, I'm very concerned about the uh, the uh, frustration that this is causing across health care and that this would uh, actually lead to... Uh, there is an extra bonus in the, um, in the Affordable Care Act for certain types of urban areas, uh, but not... And it's a, there's a set of demographic criteria for what counts as a qualifying county. Um, it doesn't include every urban area, but it doesn't include any rural area. So uh, it's, it's uh, you know, again, I'd have to look at numbers to be sure, but I would not be surprised if it turns out that uh, rural areas are harder hit. Okay. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. And thank you. Mr. Thompson, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all the witnesses for being here. Um, Mr. Wing, I want to circle back on what uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia uh, questioned about, and that's the STAR program. Uh, you are a four and a half star program. Yes, sir. Um, I'm interested to know if the uh, quality has improved because of the star program, and uh, to get your uh, input on this, give you a chance to uh, respond to the issue of, uh, of star. Uh, thank you. The five years prior to my being at SCAN, I was the Chief Operating Officer for Healthcare Partners. It was big operations in California, N Nevada, and Florida. And if uh, there was a sea change event with the STARS, when you start having incentives for quality and there's benchmarks where we can compare plans versus plan, providers versus providers, you can start having really robust conversations about how do you improve best practices, and that's what we're doing with our provider integration. We bring these 14 groups together, and we don't hide the data. They have an economic incentive to improve quality. They know who's best at each one of those 50 metrics, and then we have the physicians from those 14 groups share how do they get this best practice. I think we may debate this, but for my 30 years of being in healthcare, we now have a standard, and it's, it's caused a sea change event amongst the providers that I deal with in Arizona and California to really focus on quality. And I would say there's some debate as far as are the, are the metrics, all the right metrics, but it does deal with patient satisfaction. It does deal with medication adherence, which does reduce costs long term. It's not perfect, but I applaud the STARS program. Uh, Dr. Burnich, um, do you support the ACA's effort to create payment parity between the MA plans and uh, fee-for-service? Um, based on uh, the demographics of the current patients that are in MA, no, because they're a, uh, a sicker population that choose MA, at least at this point. It's not apples and apples. Uh, the sicker patients pick MA, and you need more resources, which means you need more revenue to manage them. Mr. Baker, same question. Um, I think, you know, the solution there is uh, increasing uh, and better uh, risk adjustment for those folks that rather than across the board uh, subsidies or overpayments to Medicare Advantage plans. Once again, uh, we look to the dual eligible special, um, you know, demonstration projects and others where, you know, risk adjustment certainly is a challenge, um, but, you know, we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good and, and need to keep on that, um, uh, on that continuum, I think also the same holds true with the special needs plans. Um, rather than you know across the board and saying to plans, you know, here's a pot of money, um, allocate it as you will, or cross subsidize your product lines. 
but rather in those uh, product lines, making sure that uh, Medicare is paying the right reimbursement for the right uh, patient given their, um, their risk of incurring costs. And of course, those that are more vulnerable and sicker are going to have a higher risk score, and so should be, you know, there should be higher reimbursement for those folks, and less um, reimbursement um, in turn for those that are healthier, um, or as was said earlier, you know, going to the gym um, uh, through the gym membership. Uh, and so, you know, that balance is always difficult to strike, um, and many plans are striking it on their own, and I think they have a partner now in CMS in trying to strike it, um, although, you know, there are going to be, you know, bumps along the way. Uh, Mr. Baker, to continue, uh, if, if you could list the three or four uh, top ways that uh, we could improve the MA program, uh, what would be on your list? Well, I think, I think you know, better risk adjustment would be one of those, um, uh, and con continuing to enhance the STAR uh, rating program uh, and making sure that, it, you know, it, it is reflective of what consumers uh, need to know. Um, I think continuing to simplify and standardize plan products. Um, you know, where there's been a lot of talk about choice and, and the, um, uh, here, but we find that consumers are paralyzed um, even by, say, 10 or 15 plan choices. Um, so, you know, with the average uh, consumer now having 18 plans, we just find that they're not, uh, you know, able to kind of make a, an intelligent choice because they're not having apples to apples comparisons. So further, um, uh, further uh, work there, um, simplification, and then finally some work on mid-year uh, provider changes. Um, there have been some mid-year provider changes that have really uh, bumped people out of uh, providers um, and they're stuck in an MA plan where their provider no longer uh, is, is contracting with. So that's another issue that we'd work, like to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one of the interesting things about sitting up here and watching you as you're watching us is watching your faces as each one is giving different testimony. And I think it would be a very uh, interesting thing to do color commentary of congressional hearings. Mm -hmm. Because when Mr. Baker made the assertion that there's no evidence of trend toward less generous benefits and then sort of following that on with um, the inquiry from Dr. Price about, to, uh, about the ability to ab absorb $3,700 and so forth. I just was looking at Mr. Wing, who looked like, you know, the expression that I saw, and these are my words and your, not your words, uh, absorb what? You know, I mean, like, how much, how much more capacity can you absorb? So, Mr. Wing, my question is not to, uh, not to weigh in on my color commentary of congressional <laughs> testimony, but that is to give some more insight. What I've heard today described are various levers, various tools that are pretty uniform across the, the witnesses. That is, um, here's, here's how this works. You can do higher costs. You can reduce benefits. You can shrink choices. You said we can vertically integrate and drive savings and so forth. But you also said something that I found interesting, and I didn't quite pick it up. Did you say that, that people with special needs are going to be uniquely impacted? Was it special needs or another word? It's special needs. Frail populations, seniors with multiple chronic conditions, the duals. You know, when I take a look at our data, 14% of our members with five or more chronic conditions consume more than half of our inpatient confinements. And so the accelerating the risk adjustment for the chronically ill, because MedPAC says the risk adjustment for chronically ill members is, is not where it needs to be. So economic incentives, we love taking care of the frail and the chronically ill, but the rest of the industry may not, and they have an economic incentive not to. And that's where we need to focus our efforts. There is the Medicare chart book says 62% of seniors with multiple chronic conditions burn 92% of the total Medicare spend. We have to be very careful about what we do, especially the impact to those seniors who've got four, five, or six, or more chronic conditions. And of those, if I may, 50% or more of them have got heart disease, which is probably not a surprise. 50% of them more have diabetes, which is not a surprise. But 50% of them more are depressed. Mm. And they're probably depressed because they're so sick and they're not getting everything they need. So this trend, to pick up on one of the examples that Dr. Barnich used, um, you talked about trying to deal with the grandmother who is probably like Mr. Wing is describing, the grandmother who wants to go to her granddaughter's graduation, that type, of, that type of patient with this cumulative nature of a lot of difficulties or special needs um, is going to be 
uniquely impacted, uniquely negatively impacted or hurt by this. Is that fair enough? Yes. Yes. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for taking the time today. I'm personally very concerned. In my district in Florida, uh, my congressional district, we have 54,000, over 54,000 on Medicare Advantage. In Florida alone, 1.4 million over that on Medicare Advantage. Uh, the state's growing back now at three, 400,000 people a year. I talk to a lot of our medical providers, a lot of our doctors. Everybody's very uh, disillusioned with where we're at. And when you think about 10,000 a day turning 65 for the next 30 years, 400,000, a lot of them are coming to Florida. So I'm very, very concerned about these cuts and the impact on a lot of our seniors, especially when you look out over uh, quite a few years. Mr. Book, I wanted to ask you, as it relates to next year, what are the cuts and benefits anticipated that you mentioned earlier? Each plan has a number of, uh, each Medicare Advantage plan has a number of levers they can, they can pull. They can, uh, they can increase premiums to patients, they can reduce copays, or, or they can reduce benefits, or they can narrow their networks. Um, each, Is there a, a percentage or a number I, I don't of have, cut I, and benefits? Have you heard that number? I, I, don't, I don't have specific numbers on, on, uh, on what plans are actually doing. Uh, we, I, we can look that up and get back to you on that okay. for sure. Uh, the, um, the bigger issue, looking down the road, because a lot of seniors might be 67, we have a lot of people staying active to 90. Right. In our, one of the things I'm concerned at is looking over 10 years, the Congressional Budget Office is saying $300 billion in cuts. What, what's the impact to the providers and to uh, our seniors, you know, all over the country, but especially in Florida, with $300 billion in cuts? So, so that's a that's a that's a cumulative cuts over 10 years. The uh, starting in 2017, that's going to be about $3,700 per patient on average. It's going to vary from place to place. We, you know, we have a uh, specific numbers for each county that uh, that I can share with you. Um, the the money has to go, has to come from somewhere. The only place it can come from is cutting benefits or making seniors pay more. Those are the only two choices. If you cut benefits. You know they're not allowed to cut, you know, ba the most basic health care benefits, but they can cut every everything else that you know th that they add on top of that. So, for example, if you cut a, if you cut coordinated care, or if you cut preventive care that's not affected by the uh, the preventive care mandate, you might end up increasing people's need for uh, health health care down the road. You know, you might end up a, uh, you, you might end up um, you know, cutting one particular category, but not. Let me, let me uh, just move on, Dr. Worse Cornett, off. Do you want to uh, comment on that, the $300 billion in cuts over the next 10 years, the impact, let's say, the medical community, the providers? I can just tell you, a lot of people in our area, very uh, disillusioned. A lot of our uh, doctors, practices for many 30 years are being consolidated by hospitals. I'm very concerned with the need going forward, with the anticipated cuts, uh, but I'd like to get it from your perspective. Yeah, there, it'll it'll diminish as I said before access. There won't be physicians to see unless they charge unless they do concierge medicine where you pay an annual fee out of your own pocket. Uh, but this uh, this cohort of patients doesn't have that kind of money, so I don't see that it's sustainable. The only place other than uh, cutting benefits or increasing premium uh, to accessing um, real dollars is in the last six months of life, and it's in the very last month of life is where we spend all the money. And I was in our AIM program, there's probably 30% that are hospice eligible, uh, but they choose not to go into hospice for various reasons, emotional, they're not ready there yet. Uh, but when we get them to go into this program, and I can't talk to you about the dollars yet because it's, I'm bound by CMMI not to do so, uh, but they're significant. And I think they're significant enough, uh, at least in this population, not all the MA lives, uh, to provide some real savings to minimize those yeah. cuts. One other question, I, my time's running out. Mr. Book, can you comment, we're seeing terminations in Medicare Advantage in our region. Mm -hmm. uh, is that because of the ACA, or do you know? Uh, it's, it's quite likely that it is. If, uh, when, when payments are reduced, if a health plan doesn't think that they can attract patients and serve them well with the level of, uh, with the level of payment they're going to get, then they might just withdraw from the market instead of have a bunch of unsatisfied patients they can't take proper care of. That's what I'm hearing. Thank you, and I yield back. 
Thank you, Ms. Black. Thank you for joining us today. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for allowing me to sit in as a non-member. I um, am so interested in these issues, and I really appreciate your allowing me to be here. Um, I want to go back to the VBID that um, Congressman Blumenauer talked about in the, the bill that we have to have a demonstration project. And um, I am just convinced that we need to look at this and make sure that it, it is what we have seen in um, in our work, but to actually have the study to show that it does work. And so um, probably, Dr. Burnage, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on such programs since you have had an innovation grant, which I understand it was initiated under MA. So if you could talk a little bit about what you think, whether you think this is um, something that's important. I think any time we can focus on value, incenting value, i.e. decreasing costs and improving quality by whatever methods is the right directional approach. Uh, and I think that's what I gleaned from where you were headed. Mm -hmm. um, and it, then it becomes, so what costs are we talking about? That's where, you know, you get into the, the nitty gritty. Mm -hmm. And that was the only piece I didn't understand about what you were saying with your bill. Well, the, the idea of this is to show that if we are able to incentivize people to use the kinds of care that the physician recommends, that they're going to have a better outcome, therefore less um, admissions to the hospital, um, especially for our, our diabetic patients and our cardiac, as you have already talked about. If we can keep them on a regime, we know that they're going to use less services and the quality of life is going to be better. Mr. Wing, would you like to weigh on that uh, in on that as well, since you are a care provider? You know, I think anything we can do with the system, with the providers, with the members, to be more compliant with proven prevention that's going to reduce system costs, reduce and improve quality, like medication adherence for hypertensives, for diabetes, I applaud. Mr. Book, do you have a, a thought on it as well? well I, I uh, have to admit I haven't seen the bill yet, but I, uh, I, it, it sounds like a good idea. I, I, one thing I would add is we talk about value-based medicine. The, um, the fees in the fee-for-service system are not set based on value to the patient. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're based on a... a uh, rather crude estimate of cost, and they specifically exclude any consideration of value to the patient. So by definition, they pay more for a high-cost, low-value service than a low-cost, high-value service. And I think that's one thing that drives up costs in the fee-for-service system and also drives patients and physicians away from low-cost, high-value services that might be better for everybody if they, weren't, if they didn't have this perverse incentives caused by the fee-for-service pricing system. I think you're making the point for my, my concept here. I want to go back to the, um, the risk adjustment model. I know we've talked a lot about that, but um, it, I'd like to know, and especially from you, Mr. Wing, and probably you, Dr. Burnage, as well, um, what you see, obviously, we, we do have to take a look at these frail patients and make sure that we are reimbursing for the true care and the nature of taking care of that patient. but. Can you give me an idea about long term um, what you think we should do about proper payment to be sure that we are, are taking care of these patients adequately and also making sure that we're um, reimbursing the care providers for the services that are provide, provided? Mr. Wing? Sure. Um, well, I think the first one of our first recommendations, and it's from MedPAC, Mark Miller, consistently talks about the slowness of the HCC model direct a correct and accurate payment for members with chronic illnesses. And if we take a look, it's what's ailing America is seniors with multiple chronic conditions. So I did a survey about our, the large national plans. Just take a look at why are they not investing or are they investing in C-SNPs like SCAM? Mm -hmm. And they're all fine companies. But if you take a look at the United, the Humanas, the WellPoints, the Cygnus, there's only one that has close to 5% of their membership. And this is as of March of this year that are in chronic special need plans, and that's United who bought XL Health a couple years ago. I believe most of these plans, they're publicly traded, they're really smart people. But the economic incentives, because of the slowness of the HCC model for chronically ill members, is they're going, this is not, quote unquote, good business. Mm -hmm. We need an HCC model to encourage all of us to go after those seniors with two, three, four, five, mm -hmm six or more chronic illnesses. That's where the 92% of the spend is. Doctor? I would agree with those statements. Uh, the other thing um, 
aside from risk, is really understanding outcomes. You know, what is the output of the decisions and, and procedures and testing that are done by physicians with patients? And our industry as a whole is very poor at longitudinal outcomes. We, we track more uh, process metrics than anything. Mm -hmm. So when somebody gets coronary artery bypass grafting, do we know that it really gave them uh, a, a better quality of life for the next X number of years, or did they really live longer? Uh, you know, one thing that I think has gotten abused, and there's literature to support it, was all the stenting of patients. I actually got called down to the OR one day by my old chief resident, who was the chief of surgery, had the patient's chest open, and he said, Jeff, take a look. And I didn't, I thought he was, you know, asking me one of these trick questions. He said, what do I see? And I couldn't distinguish the coronary anatomy because there were 27 metal stents in this patient. So, you know, that kind of overuse and abuse, we're not, we're not tracking that. And we've really got to get transparent with the output of what physicians do. Absolutely. Transparency is a big part of this. Um, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank all of our witnesses for expert testimony today. Today we've heard a detailed discussion, current status and the future of private health plans and Medicare. Clearly, significant cuts are on the horizon for the Medicare Advantage Program in 2015 and beyond, as Mr. Book uh, analyzed, $3,700 per senior. By 2017, seniors are right to be concerned, but what will happen to the health care plan they depend upon? As a reminder, any member wishing to submit a question for the record will have 14 days to do so, and if any questions are submitted to the witnesses, I ask that, that you respond in a timely manner. With that, the Mr. subcommittee. May I, yes, sir. May I, enter, uh, may I ask unanimous consent to enter in the record a GAO study uh, entitled Medicare Advantage Specialty Needs Plans Were More Profitable on Average and plans available to all beneficiaries. An article from the paper which says, despite cuts, Medicare Advantage enrollment insurers stock still surging, and three articles that say, Paul Ryan budget keeps Obama Medicare cuts full stop from the Washington Post. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since none of them relate to the issue, they will be uh, inserted as submitted. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Right. <laughs>